Good evening, good afternoon, or hello. Thanks for joining the program. My name is Sam Ankerson. I'm the executive director of the Bailey Matthews National Shell Museum, and we're delighted that you joined us for this program, which uh, which we're very very excited about. We're 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 privileged to hear about what what I think what what a lot of us here at the museum think is a is a is a truly unique and extraordinary endeavor of conservation, restoration, and education. And it also happens to be around and focused on the one of the, the best known bivalve mollusks, the oyster. Locally and regionally, uh, we, we in Southwest Florida, we may be aware of, of oyster restoration efforts um, associated with Florida Gulf Coast University, Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation, and others how important it is and how important these mollusks are to biodiversity, to water quality, to healthy ecosystems. And uh, as, you'll, as you'll learn, the work of the Billion Oyster Project is uh, it's a whole nother version of that uh, focused on, on New York Harbor and the waterways around New York City. The New York City Harbor and, and, and those waterways in that area are, are, are famous for what before the industrial revolution was a, an incredible almost unrivaled abundance of oysters and many many other forms of marine life just a great healthy uh, marine ecosystem and of course the growth of new york into one of the world's major urban centers and all the large scale pollution that came with it took a terrible toll but things are improving thanks to hard work of a lot of folks and innovative methods and you're going to hear more about all of that from uh um, from pete malinowski and um, and the work that the billion oyster project does they work as educators and researchers but they're also action takers and um they just they get things done to create and improve habitat for oysters and um and basically it, 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 and my from in my view for whatever it's worth it's just it's just really cool work in a major urban environment for which there's not uh there's not really there's not a roadmap there's not a there's not another example of the kind of work they do with any roadmap is just the one that they're that they're creating so um the for for questions and answers uh many of you have have joined our, our zoom programs before but uh, this is webinar format and um uh uh, so to 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 ask your questions, use the chat function, and we will uh, we'll keep track of those. And after Pete's talk, um, we'll we'll answer questions. I want to let you know about uh, next month's lecture, which or, or talk, which is um, our own science director and curator, Dr. Jose Leal, who on May seventeenth will give a talk on micro mollusks. You can register for that on the museum's website it's free uh, just go and click on the education bar and find lectures and go from there and on that same page you can find recordings of all past uh, zoom lectures there are about 20 now um, these are recorded and 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 posted to the museum's website as this one will be and uh, we expect this one it, it usually takes three or four days but um, um but and you know anytime you like to share this program or any any of the others with with anyone that's that's the way to do it and so now it is uh it's my pleasure to introduce pete malinowski who is the executive director of the billion oyster project uh he grew up farming oysters with his family um in on the fisher's island oyster farm on fisher's island in the long island sound beautiful place he attended the new york harbor school where he founded the school's aquaculture and oyster restoration programs and he also taught there for five years. He serves as a co-chair of the governor of New York's Shellfish Restoration Council and sits on New York City Mayor's Waterfront Management Advisory Board. And in 2014, he co-founded the Billion Oyster Project. So Pete, thanks very much for joining us for this program and, uh, and welcome and uh, take it away. All right, thank you, Sam. Thank you all so much for joining. I really appreciate it and just want to give you all a quick shout out for keeping the museum going and repairing and getting 
making these programs happen even after the hurricane. I know for, for us that it was 10 years ago with Hurricane Sandy, but I know that, that takes a lot of work and uh, programs like these that keep keep the energy moving. And so I really mm -hmm. appreciate you all joining and supporting the museum in that way. Thank you, Sam, for having me. Uh, before I start sharing my screen, I want to give a little a little uh, frame setting. So Sam mentioned I grew up on Fishers Island, New York. And as he said, it's a beautiful place. And um, it's uh, growing up in that amazing natural beauty was a real a fundamental part of making me who I am and building my appreciation for the natural world. And by coming here tonight, you are all demonstrating a similar interest in the natural world and natural things. And I encourage you all to think about the places in your lives that were instrumental in building that, um, that ethic of sort of supporting the natural world. And I believe that connection to nature is, you know, those types of experiences are required in order to build a affinity for the natural world. And so if you can all think of a, a place or a time or an experience where you were able to interact with wild animals or inter interact with natural places or important places that you go to now to enjoy nature. Um, a lot of what we're doing at Billion Oyster Project is trying to create those types of opportunities for students who otherwise wouldn't have them. You know, the unfortunate reality is, is that the, as time goes by, young people have less and less opportunities to get outdoors and interact, interact with nature. And that's especially true in cities um cities like new york so a big part of our work is designing uh programs that allow young people to get their feet wet and their hands dirty and hold wild animals and get to know nature where they live um all right i'm going to share my screen so we'll see how this goes and then go from there and the only other thing i'll add before i get any further is that um Generally, the most interesting parts of these types of presentations is the question and answer. So I encourage all of you to think about questions to ask, and we can have those time at the end to talk through questions. And that's usually the most fun for me and the most fun for you. So uh, count, counting on you all to think of some good questions to ask. All right, here we go. Bringing oysters back to New York Harbor. As Sam mentioned, New York City used to be a, you know, a, a center for oyster abundance. And New York City was known around the world for having the best tasting oysters and the most oysters. And so people would come from all over the world to eat them. And uh, they were shipped all over the world in barrels harvested from New York Harbor. But before that started, in pre-colonial times, this image on the left is from Eric Sanderson's book, Manhattan, which I recommend. And it tries to describe what New York City looked like before colonists arrived. Uh, but, but when Europeans first arrived in New York Harbor, they described you know, more fish abundance than they had seen anywhere in the world. And they wrote home and said, we'll never need to go to Sweden again for stockfish. There's more fish here than we could ever possibly eat. They described not being able to see the sky for minutes at a time because there were so many birds and could catch fish just by lowering a basket over the side of the boat and, and hauling it back up. Any of you who have ever been fishing know that it's considerably more challenging now to catch fish than it was for these folks coming into New York Harbor 400 years ago. But that type of natural abundance does not exist anywhere on earth anymore. It's all, it's all been removed and uh, it's all been removed primarily you know, through over harvesting. And that was the same challenge that happened in New York Harbor. It only took about 100 years of um, increasing harvest to decimate the local oyster population. 200,000 acres of reef were scraped off the bottom of New York Harbor and um, you know, fed, fed to New Yorkers and other folks who came to visit and people around the world. And that by harvesting all the oysters, we cut that ecosystem off at the knees. It's essentially the same as if you had a 200,000 acre forest and you chopped all the trees down. So without the building blocks of the ecosystem, the, um, you know, the, the biological productivity and the diversity of the harbor um, decreased significantly. And that worked uh, about, you know, in the late 1700s, there were no more, no significant wild oyster reefs left in New York Harbor. And New Yorkers turned to farming and actually would travel down to the Chesapeake Bay and the Delaware Bay and harvest seed oysters and bring them up to seed on New York Harbor beds. And so there was actually a 
uh, a thriving oyster farming industry in New York Harbor that lasted for another hundred years. And um, that, that worked until the completion of the Croton Aqueduct System. So New York City in the mid 1800s was actually limited in its growth by access to fresh water. Everyone was drinking well water and there wasn't any left. And so the city, the growth of the city stagnated. And that led to the development of the Croton Aqueduct system, which brought water from upstate down into the city. That was great for New Yorkers. It allowed the city population to explode. And for a while, New Yorkers were actually consuming 10 times as much water per capita as any other city in the world. And that also um, allowed New Yorkers to create flush toilets and indoor plumbing. And all of that waste from, from that growing population just went right out into the harbor. And in pretty short order, that took care of any any remaining oyster farming and oyster harvesting that, that was going on. In the um, early 1900s, people started getting sick from, there were cholera and typhoid outbreaks which were traced back to the oyster reefs. And of course it was the oysters and not pouring raw sewage on a food supply that was blamed for that challenge. And uh, the oyster reefs were shut down and you know, the last reef, the last um, farm was shut down in, in 1921. And after that, the water quality just got worse and worse throughout the harbor. So the um, that continued until the passage of the Clean Water Act in 1972. And I actually can show you more pictures. Sorry, got ahead of myself. But uh, this this shows this shows the harbor in the um, late 1800s, early 1900s, and you can see the you, these are barges of trash just shoveling trash right off the side into the harbor. Giant mountains of of oyster shell that have been harvested and just an incredible amount of boat traffic and activity in the harbor. That, uh, that pollution really compounded the over-harvesting and made it so the harbor was became a lifeless place. There's obviously still some things surviving there, but the, there were very low oxygen, very low to no oxygen in the water because of all the organic material that had been added. There are descriptions of noxious bubbles bubbling up from the bottom, trash floating by, dead horses in the harbor, and um, so from the 1920s through the 1980s, that um, that description, that perception of New York Harbor as a toxic, polluted, off-putting place carried forward. And that we still carry a lot of that legacy today. So I'm sure many of you, when thinking about the East River, and certainly most New Yorkers, when thinking about the East River, think about it as a toxic and polluted place where the reality is that since the passage of the Clean Water Act in 1972, the water has actually become much cleaner. And the East River is one of the cleanest water bodies in all of New York Harbor. So the East River and much of the rest of the harbor is actually safe for swimming most days of the year. By EPA standards, it's safe for swimming and fishing as long as it, as it hasn't rained recently. And all that runoff causes more pollution. But as long as it hasn't rained, if it was a beach, it would be open. But as New Yorkers, we still carry that legacy of a very polluted harbor. And so despite the fact that most streets in New York end at the water's edge, and um, you know, New York has 500 miles, over 500 miles of coastline, many New Yorkers travel over or under the water to get to work every day, we still don't think of ourselves as living in a port city or living surrounded by an important natural resource. And that's where Billion Oyster Project comes in. Try to remake that, rebuild a connection between the people in New York City and the natural resource around it through by engaging people in oyster restoration. And I know that you all are shell experts as we are at the Shell Museum, but I'm going to give a little bit of background about oysters in case there's some folks here who don't know how cool they are. Um, so I'll go through those kind of quickly because I know you all may already know this, but why are oysters so important? So they uh, increase biodiversity. This is underwater footage at one of our oyster reefs in, in the harbor. And what you'll see is every square inch of material that we put down as this reef is covered with living things. There are sponges, tunicates, barnacles, clams, mussels, all different kinds of algae, oysters, fish, mud snails, um, and polychaete worms. And this is a, a common theme that we see at all of our restoration sites. We see an immediate and dramatic increase in local biodiversity and species abundance at all of our sites. And this is just this, this is actually in Sunset Park right off the Brooklyn shoreline. 
It's um, it's one of my favorite places to go scuba diving in the city, but you can see the um, dramatic increase in biodiversity that comes from oyster reefs, just like trees in a forest. Here's some of our friend friendly animals. You got a uh, oyster toadfish, blue crab, sponge, and a um, tunicate. Filtering the water. I'm sure many of you have seen this, this video or one like it before, but oysters process uh, seawater, their filter feeders, and through their feeding, they can limit the concentration of nitrogen in the water. Nitrogen is the primary pollutant in all coastal, ecos all coastal ecosystems. And they, the excess nitrogen can cause nutrient imbalances and oysters through their feeding, filter the water, help clarify the water and get that um, pollution out of the water. And the, the, the last thing, oysters play a role in protecting the shore. And that's become, it is becoming increasingly relevant in New York City in our post Sandy lives, thinking about how we can use natural infrastructure to help protect the shore, protect New Yorkers from um, storm waves and storm surge. And there's a lot of investment going into various shoreline protection strategies all throughout the city. And there are places where oysters can play a really meaningful role in making that happen. So we use, we use oysters for all, all of those reasons. They enhance biodiversity, help filter the water and protect the shore. But what they also do, which, in, which I would argue is far more important for the future of our planet, is they serve as a lens to focus human enthusiasm on the natural resource. And people get excited about oysters. And so they get, it's allowed us to grow our organization and it's allowed us to attract the resources we need to, to survive and grow as an organization, but also it's allowed us to attract New Yorkers from all walks of life to come together with us and work on restoring New York Harbor. Um, and you have a brief cameo for my son, Max. So he's here in the orange life jacket. Give him a shout out. He's much bigger now. So that enter Billion Oyster Project. So we know all the stuff about oysters. We know the problems the city has. How are we working to do that? We're trying to restore 1 billion oysters by 2035 and to engage 1 million people in, the work, in that work. And we pick those numbers because we believe a billion oysters is the level of intervention that's necessary to get the population of oysters in the harbor to a point where it can grow and expand on its own. And a million people is one in 10 New Yorkers. And we believe that if one in 10 New Yorkers work with us down at the water's edge, restoring New York Harbor, then that's the level of intervention that's necessary to shift how the city as a whole thinks about the harbor. <laughs> and um, you know, New Yorkers, millions of New Yorkers leave New York City every year to go find natural places. And we wanna shift that paradigm and have New Yorkers instead look for nature here at home. Sorry. So when we think about our future state that we're trying to we're trying to work towards, uh, the vision of Billion Oyster Project is a future in which New York Harbor is the center of a rich, diverse, and abundant estuary. The communities that surround this complex ecosystem have helped construct it and in return benefit from it with endless opportunities for work, education, and restoration. The harbor is a world-class public space, well used and well cared for, our commons. And we think of New York Harbor as New York City's biggest and best looking open space. We believe that New Yorkers should care as much about the harbor as they do about Central Park and should be equally as upset about a mess in New York Harbor as they would be about a mess in Central Park. General life cycle for a billion oyster project oyster. Oysters start their lives as larvae, swim around for about two weeks. We collect shells from 75 restaurants, mostly in Brooklyn and Manhattan, about 5,000 pounds of shell per week. And that comes out of the waste stream and out to Governor's Island. And we put that shell in various reef structures or bags, add them to setting tanks, and then the oyster larvae will actually swim around and attach the shells. From that point, the oysters are ready to go into various reef structures, whether they're used by schools, community groups, or for our large scale restoration work. And then they go out in the harbor. Sam mentioned the Harbor School. I was not actually a student at Harbor School, although I would have loved to be. I went to school, uh, I grew up out on Fisher's Island, as he also said, but Harbor School is a public high school. It's free for students. 
It's part of the New York City Department of Education and the, uh, the, it has a marine focus. So students at Harbor School specialize in one of seven career and technical education programs. And you can see them here on the screen, but they're aquaculture, professional diving, marine systems technology, vessel operations, ocean engineering, marine biology research, and marine policy and environmental advocacy. And I joined the school in 2008 to, to start the aquaculture program. And we started growing oysters in class to restore them to New York Harbor. And that became a, a, a narrative that we use to teach and learn around and require that student work products have relevance outside of the classroom. And we quick, quickly realized that we didn't just need oyster farmers in order to do that, but we also needed scuba divers and uh, people to maintain the boats and drive the boats and design the reefs and conduct science experiments and advocate for our ability to put oysters in the water. So we used Billion Oyster Project initially as a unifying theme for all of the career and technical education programs at Harbor School to work together on. And we, we like to say that, uh, you know, how, how can you expect students to be responsible if you never give them any responsibility? And that's a core tenant of Harbor School and Billion Oyster Project. Rather than telling students that to, to be quiet, sit down, do their work, try harder, we say, can you please help solve these complex problems that we don't yet know the answers to? And the idea of getting students with different expertise sitting around a table, chatting through how best to restore a reef somewhere in the East River and the Hudson River is a really, that's, where, that's what we live for. That's the types of experience that we're trying to create for students. And here are some aquaculture students monitoring oysters under the Manhattan Bridge, right off of Brooklyn Bridge Park. And students in the welding program building our reef structures. We rely on students to build the reef structures and we design our reefs with steel frames because we wanna teach students how to weld. It's a good example of how the, the design of our restoration work helps support teaching and learning in the classroom. And this is just a cool picture of a student standing on top of a giant pile of shells. I thought you all would appreciate. When we launched Billion Oyster Project as a as an initiative of the nonprofit outside of Harbor School, the goal was to take the, the, that style of teaching and learning that had worked at Harbor School and broadcast it throughout the city. So we took the components of hands-on learning, place-based education, working with local species and um, expecting students to produce work products that had value outside of the classroom and designed, educa and designed educational programs that could work in any school in the city. So we do that primarily in middle schools through curriculum development, We developed a sixth through eighth grade STEM curriculum that allows teachers to teach what they're normally tasked with teaching, but through the lens of the local ecosystem. We provide professional development for teachers so they have more success teaching in the field and can implement our curricula. And we provide uh, oyster research stations to all of our school partners, either in the form of a cage that hangs off of a bulkhead near the school or an oyster research tank, which will be a tank in their classroom. This on the right here on the top, on the top is a picture of an oyster research station. What you'll notice is that again, every available bit of surface area is covered with, with living things, primarily animals. And we see that throughout the harbor. So students spend their time in the classroom learning the background they need in order to understand what's happening in, in the field and go into the field a few times a year to monitor their oyster research stations. And during those events, they'll pull the cage up onto the bulkhead, measure the growth and survival of the oysters, identify the sessile invertebrates on the cage, and look at percent cover of different organisms, identify the mobile organisms that come up with the cage, and you'll see everything from seahorses to grass shrimp, amphipods, lots of different fish species, mud crabs, small blue crabs will all come off these cages. And then they also monitor water quality. In order to do that effectively, they need to know about they need to have learned already about the ecosystem in the harbor. They need to know about the physical chemical properties of water and the factors that affect it. And so the curriculum supports that experience in the field. Um, here's a random middle school 
class that, that, that we've worked with. We currently work with about 150 middle schools. So today and every day in the spring and the fall, you know, multiple classes of middle school students are down at the water's edge doing these types of activities. For many of these students, it'll be the first time holding a wild animal, interacting directly with it, the first time really realizing that there are that there is life below the surface of the water in New York City. Yeah. These are our, our community reefs. So outside of, in addition to working with public school students, we engage communities by building reefs at waterfront sites around the city. In order to get to a billion oysters, we need to work at an industrial scale. And this is our remote setting facility in the, in, um, in the Red Hook container terminals. We rely on the container terminals to help us with the heavy lifting. These are shipping containers that we've modified as aquaculture tanks where we put our reef structures in the tank, fill them with water, add the oyster larvae, and then when they're ready to go, we'll just put the tanks right onto barges for the deployment. And you can see one of these deployments in action here. So this is at the, at the mouth of the Bronx River. Um, we call this our Soundview Park Reef because of a park that's right there. But what you can see in the video is uh, those reef structures getting hauled out of the shipping containers and positioned at their specific sites where they'll be installed. And then in a second, you'll get to see the uh, release the reef structures into the water. But on, and on the right, you can see, see uh, this is a hard clam shell and oyster shells covered with small live oysters. It's kind of boring, sorry. So here the reef structures going into the water, and that's how the um, deployment works. And in this way, we're able to restore anywhere from 30 to 50 million oysters per year. We're trying to get that number up to 100 million oysters in the next by, by next field season. This shows our spread throughout the city. So the um, different colors are either restaurants, oyster nurseries, schools oyster research stations or community partners. There's obviously some concentrations in Manhattan and along the Brooklyn shoreline, but the idea in order to shift the culture in New York City, change how people think about and interact with the environment is we need to get all throughout the city. And this just shows how we've, how we've managed to get into various parts of the city. I forgot to tell one story that's a pretty good one. So I'm gonna go back a couple slides, apologize for that. I think this is pretty relevant. Um, so I, on the lower right here is our field station at Coney Island Creek. Coney Island Creek is likely will likely be designated a, a federal Superfund site because it's so polluted. But we've been working there for the last 10 years or so. And um, by, by monitoring water quality in Coney Island Creek, we were able to identify a dry weather sewage discharge. So what happens in New York City is every time it rains, the wastewater system is, is um, inundated and all of that household waste flows out into the harbor. And you can monitor those. You can see that signal by monitoring bacteria concentrations in the water. And we see that every time it rains, you see a big spike in the amount of bacteria that's present in the human gut here in New York Harbor. And what we discovered in Coney Island Creek was that that signal was present even on dry days. So that meant that something was wrong, something wasn't working properly. And we worked with state regulators, New York City Department, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation to do some investigate. They did some investigative work and were able to trace that discharge to an apartment complex that had never been effectively hooked up to the municipal sewer system. So there's a big apartment complex, a thousand units that was just dumping right out into Coney Island Creek. The, 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 the developers and all those responsible were fined and they solved that problem. And now the water quality in the creek is a lot better because of it. The reason I share that story is that had we not been trying to access the harbor, had we not been working to restore New York Harbor, no one would have known about that. And it just goes to show that the, how awareness and affinity for the resource can lead to a to a better condition for the the environment. And we see similar stories like that all over the city, whether it's 
identifying water quality issues or identifying things that prevent people from safely accessing the harbor and working to change them over time. Um, get back to where I was, sorry. So overall, since 2014, we've restored 100 million live oysters on about 16 acres of harbor bottom at 18 sites. We've collected over, it's actually two and a half million pounds of shell now. We've worked with 8,000 public school students and have gone through these programs in, in, in one way or another. And we've engaged 11,000 volunteers in hands-on restoration work. And that's over the last 10 years. We have essentially another 10 years to do 10 times that amount of work. And um, so for us, it's a lot about scaling everything we're doing to, to uh, meet that level of pr production that we need in order to reach our goals. But what we're seeing, um, what we're seeing throughout the harbor and throughout the city is incredibly encouraging. I've been driving boats around New York Harbor for the last almost 15 years now. And even in that time, the, um, the change in the abundance and diversity of animals has been dramatic, not just at our reef sites, but throughout the harbor. We can't take full credit for that. It's about the um, you know, less pollution overall, the harbor being in such a depressed state for so long and then being allowed to bounce back. But New York Harbor right now is one of the most it's it's the place I would go if I wanted to see wading birds or you know, watch turns, pick, pick fish out of the water or look for kingfishers or northern skimmers or any of these cool birds that people travel miles and miles in order to see. You can find them all in New York Harbor. It's a place where you can find dolphins and seahorses and occasionally whales, regular uh, resident seals that are on the island. Bald eagles are coming back. Ospreys are coming back, peregrine falcons are coming back. So it's this amazing time to be in New York City where the abundance of animals is, is increasing dramatically. Water quality continues to improve. And, the, um, and on land, more and more New Yorkers are more and more concerned about the condition of New York Harbor, their ability to safely access it. The, uh, there's more and more interest in human powered boats and kayaking and canoe clubs and swimming at the harbor, at beaches in New York City, but also some places in, in, in the upper bay in the harbor. And that's what um, keeps us going, keeps us excited about doing this work and, and continuing on is that we're part of this incredibly inspiring wave of improvement that's been really exciting. Um, the last thing is that each, each year for the last five or so years, we see more and more wild oysters showing up throughout the harbor. It's again, incredibly encouraging. I think that's it for me talking at you all. Um, happy to hear any questions you all have. Thank you so much for having me. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Pete, very, very, very much. Yeah, folks, uh, feel free to to type in your questions. I know, I know there, there's a couple there. I had um, I had one before we get started with other questions, which is about uh, or a couple, but. Um, Kind of other waterways in the New York area, you know, is you know moving out from the New York Harbor. Is there just? I know your work is focused on New York Harbor, but going up the Hudson or you know, out on you know to Long Island Sound or any of those areas. Are there? Are there? Um, I don't know. Are there efforts underway, or there, is it you know what, what's the sort of composition of the of the issues around oysters um, in those in those waterways? Yeah, the, the I mean, oysters have been removed. Ninety-five percent of oyster reefs worldwide have been removed by people. Have been eaten, and that, so that's true in New York Harbor, the Hudson River, and Long Island Sound, and everywhere else. Um, the there is there are some oyster restoration programs happening on Long Island, and we go out into Western Long Island. You know, New York Harbor, as we know, it goes out into Western Long Island Sound and up the Hudson River to the Tappan Zee Bridge. And so we have restoration projects in those places. Um, as soon as you get about 30, well, I guess 40 miles from New York City, you start getting into places where people can grow oysters. And so there's active oyster farming happening in throughout Long Island Sound and down in New Jersey. 
and uh, the south shore of Long Island. So it goes pretty quickly once you leave the polluted waters of New York Harbor, you get to a place where you, where the restoration turns to commercial aquaculture. Yeah. Okay. And just have one more question before we go to the to the floor, as I say, um, the community community reef projects, you, which you mentioned, sound cool. Can you say a little bit more about that? Kind of like what those how those work. Yeah, so we we find places in New York City. We try to target those sites at places where you can, can walk down into the water. There's not a lot of places like that in New York City where it's where you're able to walk down into the water. And we also target that intervention around communities that have traditionally lacked access to the water. And we use a, a small reef installation as a way to, to, to create a pathway down to the sort of a figurative and physical pathway down to the water's edge. So we use the, we'll build a small reef structure, you know, maybe half a million oysters, um, about half the size of a tennis court. And the, and those are, we rely on volunteers and community members and local school groups to carry that stuff down to the water. And then um, periodically, once we install once we install a community reef, we have to go back and monitor the reef, take sections of the reef up on the shore to see whether or not the oysters are surviving, what other animals are associated with it. And all of those activities are opportunities for public engagement. Mm -hmm. So that's a, um, the function of a, community reef or a field station is as much, I mean, it's more focused on being a, a community engagement exercise than an ecological restoration exercise. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Well, that was a great idea. Okay. Um, when do you plan to start? Okay, that was before the program started. <laughs> Um, Barbara asks, uh, what work are you doing on Long Island? Yeah, right, right now our, our work is, is pretty limited to New York Harbor. So we work with some schools on Long Island, but there are other nonprofits and universities doing the restoration work on Long Island. Uh, Lisa asks, how do you find slash farm oyster larvae? Um, oyster larvae need all the same things that adult oysters need, sort of. Uh, they need clean water and food. And their food is phytoplankton, small photosynthetic organisms that swim around the water column. So an oyster hatchery has a system for cultivating phytoplankton mm -hmm. and then a, a parallel system for growing oysters. And the way you produce oyster larvae is you get a bunch of adult oysters, you trick them into thinking it's summertime when it's not, and they'll produce their gametes and stimulate them to spawn because they'll release their gametes into the water column, collect all the eggs, fertilize the eggs, and then add those to tanks. Um, it's a pretty involved process, so it's hard to say concisely, but the, put them into tanks um, where they can swim around, add food to the tanks, and every day you drain the full volume of the tank over a screen to capture the larvae fill the tank back up with water, add the larvae and add more food. And you do that for two weeks as the, as the oysters grow. And then when they're ready to go through metamorphosis and grow their own shells, you can introduce them to a substrate, often oyster shell or a reef structure that we're working with. Um, in, for commercial applications, they use powdered oyster shell. And then the oyster larvae will cement themselves to the shell, go through metamorphosis, grow their own shells and start their lives that way. Patricia asks, what do you do with the mountains of shells? We, we use the, the shells are our, our primary substrate for, for our reef. So it's a, it's a building material that we use. Um, so it all goes back into the harbor covered with live oysters. So we bring, bring the shell into our setting tanks once it's clean. And then um, either individually in shells and baskets or within those reef structures you saw. And the oyster larvae will attach to the shells and then they go back into the harbor. Inke asks, do you have scientific data collection for survival of deployed spat? Yeah, we're, we're, we're interested to know the, the success that our oysters have once we, once we install them. And we're also required by law to monitor that. So there's a, 
good incentive for collecting that, that, that data. Um, so we know at all of our sites what the survival rate is, how well the oysters are doing. And it, to get ahead of the follow-up question, the, the, um, it varies at different sites. Oysters survive better than at other sites. And we view our installations all as research projects. So we're trying to learn where the oysters do best. What we look for uh, success is having a 10% a survival rate over, over three years. So we put 5 million oysters on an acre of bottom in the hopes that in three years, there's 500,000 three-year-old oysters on that site. And that's an industry standard metric. So most of our sites will you know, exceed that survival, those survival metrics, but all of our stocking densities are designed in order to achieve that final outcome. It's half, half a million breeding adults after three years. All right, Bree has a question. How can youth get involved in events to help with the Billion Oyster Project? My daughter was watching this call with me and she wants to help. All right, so Bree, Bree is, I, I was not aware that Bree was joining, but Bree is actually a, a former student of mine at the New York Harvard. <laughs> so, hi, Bree, thanks for joining. <laughs> the uh, students get, get involved in a variety of ways. Um, the easiest way for young students is through their school. So uh, this is this is limited to New York City, which I know most of the group is not from. Bree does live in New York City, but the you know as parents or as students, you can encourage your teachers to join Billion Oyster Project and become Billion Oyster Project teachers, and that's the easiest way for younger kids to get involved. Once you get once you're 16, you can come out and volunteer. So we have vol public volunteer days four days a week six months out of the year. And uh, we encourage everyone who wants to sign up on our website and come out and help. Joe, thanks Joe, has a question. Have you had pushback from uh, commercial shipping and or recreational boaters about oyster farming in the Harbor? It's a big issue in Southeastern Connecticut. Yeah, big issue in Southeastern Connecticut um, and everywhere that oyster farming is happening, I'm sure. and. The we do not the big difference between how we farm, how we restore oysters compared to how a farm works is that farms often have a lot of floating gear that is uh, at the surface and could be hit by boats. All of our reef installations are on the bottom. And so that helps some of that conflict, that use conflict. Another big difference is that there's not a lot of recreational. I mean, I guess there are a lot of recreational boaters, but there's not a lot of fishing and <clears throat> sailing that happens in New York Harbor. And I think that that is a, is a big di difference also. And the fishing and sailing that happens in New York Harbor, there's a certain level of comfort with other uses. So there's obviously a ton of ferry traffic and commercial vessels all the time. And so there's a little bit less of a use conflict there. As far as commercial shipping goes, 95% of New York Harbor is outside of shipping lanes. So there's there's a real, uh, there's a, you know, it's pretty easy to avoid conflicts with commercial traffic. All right, Nohora, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Is this project seasonal? Is it year round? And then what is the quality taste of the oysters? Which links to something which I think I read, which is, well, I guess you you, you should say, it. but 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 we can't. We're not eating the oysters out of New York Harbor, right? Yeah, these are these oysters have a more important job to do than to be food for people. So they're they're um, um, so one we we don't want to harvest them. We want them to stay on the bottom and do their good work. And two, it is illegal to harvest oysters from New York Harbor. The water quality, excuse me, the water is not clean enough for that. So the we don't eat the oysters. Um, and we hope that nobody is harvesting our oysters for that reason. I actually do know two people who ate oysters out of New York Harbor. One was a, I won't say their names, but one was an author, super nice, kind of bookish type of guy. And the other is a fireman in the Marine unit. And the fireman is one of the most physically imposing people I've ever met. <laughs> and... Um, the author ate an oyster out of the mouth of the Bronx River and was totally fine. And fireman had the an oyster out of the, out of the Hudson River and was 
couldn't get out of bed for two weeks. So I think that that's the uh, that's the risk you take in eating oysters from New York Harbor. <laughs> and I mean, I guess a follow up question for me is, I mean, is there a sense of how long it might be, or is that is that sort of something that's too kind of vague to try to put a we prediction can, on? It, it's it's really up to us. And it's up to the public opinion in New York City. As soon as it's a, as soon as it becomes enough of a priority for people who live in New York, to stop contaminating our biggest open space with mm. human waste, then we can start solving that problem. Right now, the um, we've done a really good job in making the water quality a lot better, and it's gotten to a point. And in order to get that beyond that point, requires more investment, and that won't happen until. Everyone in New York City is upset about contaminating our water with sewage pollution. Ted Drick from Reading. How hard is it to secure permits to make oyster beds? What's that process like? I was wondering about that too. Yeah, it's it's very challenging. The uh, it's the biggest limiting factor to us getting to a billion oysters. It's one of the hardest things that we do. We have full time staff members who work all year just um applying for permission to put oysters in the water we carry over a hundred active environmental permits that all have their own reporting and renewal requirements and in a given year we'll submit anywhere from four to six thousand unique pages of permitting documents so it's an enormous amount of work it makes it really challenging it's incredibly limiting to the scale that we're, we're able to operate at and it's it's pretty frustrating to to you know, our, our oyster reefs require a similar level of permitting as a construction project. You know, it's the same. There's a million rules to keep bad things out of the water, and there's no rules to make it easier to put good things back in the water. Right, right, right. So an ability to navigate the bureaucracy is yeah. also yeah the key to what you do. Jose, who's our our curator here, uh, has a question. He says thanks for a great talk, which it absolutely was. Any studies on biodiversity on your oyster reef areas through time or before and after the start of the project? Yeah, we have to, we're required also to, as part of our permit applications, to demonstrate habitat uplift, which means that the, the habitat we've created, we, we, we always replace something when we build an oyster reef. We'll replace a mud flat or a sandbar or something that was there prior to the oysters going down. And in order to maintain our permissions, we have to demonstrate habitat uplift. And we do that by looking at species abundance and diversity on and off the, on and off the reef site before and after construction. And what we see at all of our sites is an immediate and dramatic change. The, you, know, you go down on a you scuba dive down on the bottom of the harbor and you won't be able to see any animals. Of course, there are worms and other things living in the, living in the sediment. But just a few weeks after installing an oyster cage, going back to the same an oyster reef, going back to that same site, you can't not see animals. Everywhere you look, you see living things. And that happens. We have quantitative data that supports that, but it's also it's incredibly obvious and it happens fast. Gene Burks has a question. Also big accolades for the project and, and for you. Um, have you tracked how many of your young, uh, how many of your, your students, your young middle school students have gone on uh, to focus on this in their professional life? I guess over the last 10 years since you've been working with students, any, any sense of how, you know, if any of them have gone on to follow in your footsteps, work in this field and, you know. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a, you know, we have four Harvard School graduates on our on our full-time staff at Billion Oyster Projects. So that's one great example. Um, there are students, about half the commercial vessels working in New York Harbor has, have Harbor School graduates working on them. The, um, there's a, a big um, you know, concentration of, of Harbor School graduates that go on to study marine biology, environmental science, and um, go to SUNY Maritime and get their um, you know, shipping licenses, they can work on commercial vessels. And then there are plenty of other students who go on to do, you know, things not related at all to what we're doing. And the, the, um, the idea with career and technical education is both preparing, it's preparing students for college and career. It's the, uh, the idea that 
that students when they finish high school can can be empowered with that choice and decide right to go right into the industry or pursue their education further or to go into the industry and then pursue their education. So they have that empowered with that choice. And the career and technical education schools in New York City enjoy the highest graduation rates, the highest college preparedness rate, the best attendance of any of the public schools in New York City. And that's a tribute to that kind of hands-on learning that you're, you may be learning how to drive a boat, but you're also learning how to handle yourself, how to be professional, how to work on a team, how to show up on time, how to take responsibility for your school work, because if you don't, mm -hmm. you get hurt. And that mm -hmm. kind of, uh, all, all of those lessons go a long way um, towards things like college preparedness and mm -hmm. attending and graduation rate and college success. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, Cedric has another question. Do any companies buy nitrogen credits from you? Uh, we don't do that. We haven't figured that out. Um, seems like something that's out there, but the uh, we haven't entered that market. Barbara asks, is there an opportunity for waterfront businesses and neighbors who have docks on the water to help? Also, does Kings Point or Maritime assist? Yep. SUNY Maritime is a, we, we work with them all the time. Well, Kings Point left, but but um, they're also great, great advocates for our work. But SUNY Maritime is a close partner. We send most of the most of the students at SUNY Maritime who went to public school in New York City come from Harbor School to SUNY Maritime. The waterfront at SUNY Maritime is littered with oysters. We have oysters growing in all manner of different ways on their waterfront, and they're um, incredibly supportive and helpful. And that's the main way that businesses or um, yeah, businesses or landowners that have waterfront properties can help is by providing access for our students and our and our oysters. Uh, just a follow up uh, comment, I guess, on that question is uh, I've, I've been reading about you guys for a long time. And, and you know, I, among the things that I find completely impressive is just the the, the myriad of, of, of partnerships and collaborations that you have, you know, just um, to 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 advance this work. I mean, it's really um, it's amazing, you know. It's a, uh, it's uh, it's really impressive. Well, um, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say that, that you know we learned pretty quickly that the only way we would ever be successful is by involving as many different people as possible, and that's it's a it's an advantage of doing this type of work in a place like New York City. Right. And there's a lot of a lot of uh, um, a lot of skilled people. A lot of right. Certain folks who can help out. Yeah, right. Uh, Inke with another question. Are the structures you deploy the shell with spat, sorry, are the structures you deploy the shell with spat on biodegradable? Uh, it's a mix. So we do occasionally use plastic mesh bags <laughs> for some reconstruction. Uh, that, that's the, the, the construction technique that we use the, the least. Uh, we we experimented with a bunch of different biodegradable bags. Uh, depending on the application, there are if, if the application if the installation is required to hold sediment for a period of time in an active where there's a lot of water movement, there are times when plastic is the only thing to do that. But the, that we found is the biodegradable mesh bags don't last very long. Those are. Um, very few of our installations, very few of our oysters go down in bags at all. The vast majority of them go down in steel framed uh, gabions with steel mesh, and those are designed to degrade over time. I don't know if you would, if that would be, if that's considered biodegradable steel, but right. they, they do go away without harming the marine environment over a period of time. Um, and the the idea there is that the oysters actually become the structure, and over the course of ten or fifteen years, the steel you know, disappears. Barbara asks, "Is there a placement system of Harbor School graduates into industry?" Yeah, and it's sort of relevant to the answer earlier. But the, as a career and technical education school, Harbor School is required to have a professional advisory committee made up of industry local industry experts who provide advice on the curriculum, provide internships, and are also natural job 
opportunities for the students at Harbor School. So that, that definitely happens a lot. Um, and I, I have a, a, I don't see any other questions here. I have one more, which is you, you were commenting before on what you, you've seen over the last 15 years, the encouraging signs you've seen um, returning wildlife. And um, I guess, I guess maybe building on that a little bit, just what do you, what's your assessment of the state of, of New York Harbor? Yeah, the um, I think if if every if everyone in New York City knew knew New York Harbor like I know New York Harbor, all this pollution stuff would stop. And the the huge luxury of my job is a privilege to get to spend so much time on the water looking at this stuff. I mean, my, my perception of New York Harbor is one of of dramatic improvement. There's not a lot of I think there's probably other cities that are that are seeing similar things that have been much more polluted and are now getting a lot better. But it's really, uh, you know, the harbor is it's the first place I'd look if I was going to go birding, be in New York mm. Harbor. Mm. Yeah. Well, um, well, thank you. I mean, and again, congratulations on your work. It's uh, it's making a big impact. It's it's original. It's it's very interesting as we've all as we've all learned tonight. And for folks on the Zoom, this was originally planned as a as an in person lecture. Pete was going to come down and spend some time, I think, with his family in, uh, in Sanibel. And, uh, and we hope that that can, that that can happen, you know, at some point in the not too distant future. We really appreciate you, um, you know, uh, making time for this and, and sharing your story with, um, with us and, you know, great work. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Sam. Thank you, all, thank you all for the questions and for joining. I really, really appreciate it and I'm excited to come see the Shell Museum at some point. All right. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining the program. All right. Good night. Good night.